to start this? Um, well, I think that Tommy and I are going to be simultaneously demonstrating. He's going to be doing some stuff on the wheel. I'm going to be doing some hand building. Um, if you have any questions while we're demonstrating, we're both very open to just asking those questions. Um, and probably like what the, the flyer said is, you know, Chandra makes a body of work, I make a body of work, and then we make a collaborative body of work. So we're going to see if we can juggle all three of those in front of you guys tonight. So there might be a lot of questions, or there might not be any questions. <laughs> so we'll just play by ear, see how it goes. So I'm going to be starting with my own work, and I'm going to make a spoon a, a couple of different ways. And what are you going to be I'm doing? I'm just going to throw some stuff on the wheel. Are you throwing collaborative pots? Yes. OK, cool. All right. All right, let's do it. OK. OK. Yes. After the intermission of, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. We're going to try to do it all. That's right. So I'm going to go ahead and do a hand-built spoon here to start with. And um, spoons have been pretty trendy to make for the last couple of years. Um, they're super fun, I think, to make. They're not the most practical objects ever. Ceramic spoons have a tendency to break. Um, but I just think they're beautiful. And um, I actually have a wooden scoop that I use for my coffee in the morning, and I absolutely love it. And I designed a um, ceramic scoop off of that original wooden prototype. So what I'm doing is I'm just going to create a solid hunk here, and I'm just kind of tapping it out into a general shape that has, this is going to be the spoon bowl, and then this is going to be the handle for the spoon. Nope, this one's going to be solid. So the first spoon that I'm going to make is going to be something where I find the form through a reductive process. So um, it's going to be solid, and then after it stiffens up a little bit, I'm going to take a sure form and, um, and shred the clay off and find the form inside of it. I've really enjoyed that way of working. Um, a lot of the work that I make has hollow elements. Volume is really important to me. Um, soft volumes, but lately I've been playing with um, a little bit of a heavier, because when something's hollow, it's lighter, and I really love the, ho the solid uh, weight of a, of a solid handle as a counterweight to a counterbalance for that spoon. Some of my um, hollow handled spoons are really light, and it almost feels like they're going to fly out of your hand, but the, the solid handle really feels stable, so I've been exploring that through function. Okay, so as I have this kind of general, it looks like a paddle, right? Like some sort of sports paddle, like for ping pong or something. And then I'm just going to get um, a piece of upholstery foam here, a couple of inches. I'm going to actually double up just a little bit extra. And I'm going to take a wooden ball, and I'm going to push the wooden ball into the solid clay form to make the spoon bowl part. So then I have a really great curve right here, and I'm just going to set this aside to stiffen up. And then by taking that sure form, I'll carve away. What are you doing, Tommy? So I just centered a piece of clay, and then I opened that piece of clay. <laughs> um, how many of you guys have thrown on the wheel before? OK, good. Um, how many of you guys haven't? OK. Um, Typically, when, I, I, when I first learned to throw pots, I was kind of taught the like drill down like an oil derrick method and then expand out from there. And I, I, don't, I don't do that anymore. I saw somebody else basically just create like a volcano and just like deepen that volcano. And I realized that there was, that seemed like a better solution. Because what I was able to do is actually kind of avalanche the clay, you know, and create a condensed bottom. You know how you get S cracks because we never get enough compression at the bottom? Uh, it's like a sponge, you know? So the oil derrick was just drilling through the middle of that hole as opposed to this where I'm now compressing that bottom. And then the amount of compression that you get at the bottom is going to be equal to the amount of compression you're going to get when you're throwing the walls so that you're less likely to have S cracks, which is great because I don't have time to throw half our pots away. You know, I mean, it's like, oh, Chandra, look what I made for you, this cracked thing, you know? So instead I just compress everything like crazy at the bottom. And then what I'll do is I'll just, you know, use my thumb to really kind of dig underneath there and push as much of that clay up into the wall as I can. 
because uh, the type of shape that I'm going for is something like this. So I don't have to trim a whole lot because then I gotta spend time reclaiming my trimmings or I have to spend money throwing that clay away. And I much rather just put it into the pot in general. So I'll shove that in there. And pull these walls up. For now, yeah. And we keep threatening that one day she's gonna make the forms and I'm gonna decorate them. But we actually like things that look good. So, <laughs> um, so uh, they, they might be really great forms if she makes them, but who knows on the decoration. This guy. So Tommy has decorated some forms and we will leave it up to you to find those forms when you come to the Cannon River Clay Tour. Oh, that's good. Now they have to come. Uh huh. Ah. The type of clay that I'm using, it's called SRF and it's made by Aardvark, which is a company based out of California. I think they and, and Laguna are like, you know, a mile from each other or something, so they like to compete. Uh, the S, the R, and the F all stand for something, and I don't know what it is. <laughs> I think the R is red, so we're getting close. Um, I think it's stoneware, red, functional. Sounds good, right? I'll, I'll call up their PR department. Uh, it's kind of groggy and uh, it has a really nice red color. And then when we put soda wash and things like that on it, we kind of get a nice red to brown color. What we're trying to mimic with this collaborative work is some of the uh, urban landscape that we see in Kansas City. You know, that's pretty familiar to what we see in the Midwest in general. Uh, instead of like the, the big cities that had lots of money that could tear down their old buildings and build new skyscrapers, we didn't have that. So we were able to hold on to a lot of the really great older architecture that exists. And a lot of that stuff in Kansas City, anyway, is made out of brick. And so we're trying to like pay homage to that. Basically, it's just a response to this really great urban environment where we live. You guys probably have that here, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, you see a lot of that around there. So you're pretty, it's, you're, it would be familiar to you, too. Uh, so when we're looking at the decorative process, you know, the, the sidges and the slips that go on there are trying to get some of these ghost sign images that you find on old buildings, you know, where you've got a sign, an, an advertisement for something that was there 50, 60 years ago. They kind of got rid of it, but not completely, and that makes it all the more beautiful. So we're trying to mimic some of that stuff too. But it all starts with this kind of red brickish clay. I'm gonna throw you off a little bit because I'm okay. gonna talk about what I'm doing. All right, let's see what you got. Um, I'm gonna make another spoon based off of a two-dimensional shape that I cut out of a piece of scrap plywood. So um, this is the outline of the spoon, and then I drilled a pilot hole and then cut with a jigsaw around the shape and then lightly sanded those edges down. And this plywood is about, I would say, uh, 3 8 inch thick. Um, so I, I've got two of them there because I, they're going to create two sides that are going to get attached together so that the form will be hollow. And um, I could, if I just made one, I would have to create two of these separately. So because I've created them out of one piece of plywood, I can create them both at the same time. So I've rolled out my slab here that's um, a little bit thicker than a quarter of an inch and a little thicker than three eighths. It's not very precise. And I'm just going to place it on my plywood mold and I'm going to tap it on the side of the table. I'm just sure. This is the part where I get loud and Tommy can't talk over me, so. So like I was saying. <laughs> and I'm just turning it and tapping it about four times. And you can see that through gravity, the clay is falling and dropping into that mold. So I'm just using the force of gravity. So with the one that I um, made solid, I was using force of the wooden ball to push into the, into the sponge. Just gonna tap it a little bit more. And this is the reason why I start with a thicker slab is so that I have enough um, volume that can, that can be created without the slab breaking on that edge. When you start to see, I don't know if you all can see this on the camera, there's a tiny little shadow that develops right on that inside rim. That is a sign that that clay is getting weak and stretching right there and it's about ready to crack. So I watch for that shadow and then I stop tapping. And then I'm just going to turn it over and pop it out. 
The plywood's really great because it absorbs moisture and it doesn't stick to the clay. It does get saturated, so I have to be conscious if I'm going to make a bunch of these, I have to turn them over and use the other side or let this dry um, between too many uses. I can usually use it a couple of times, but once um, it gets too saturated, the clay will start to stick to the plywood. And then I'm gonna cut these in half just to get that excess clay off of there and free it up. And then what I'm going to do, I'm just gonna tell you what I'm gonna do and then I'm gonna do it and maybe Tommy will have something to say what, what he's doing. I'm gonna go ahead and cut this out, holding the knife parallel to the slab itself so that I can maximize that ledge so that I have a larger surface area for attachment. Um, I'm gonna cut that and then I'm gonna do the same thing to the other side and then I'm going to attach them. This clay is really wet right out of the bag. Um, I, I really like that for a couple of reasons. I'm, I'm kind of an impatient person and <laughs> the project that we're all given in Beginning Ceramics to make that stiff-sided box, I hated that project because I didn't have the patience to wait for my slab to dry. So I don't have to wait for my slab to dry. In fact, if my slab was dry, this whole technique wouldn't really work for me and what I'm going to be doing. So the wet clay um, is beneficial. Take it away. Tom. Okay, so I'm centering again. This will kind of give you an idea of what I was talking about before. So instead of going down and out, it's just kind of going straight down at an angle like that. I wish you'd plan this better. I feel like I don't have anything good to say. <laughs> Anybody read any good books lately? Not a cup this time. So this will, yeah, this will either be a really big cup. No, it'll be a bowl. And um, bowls, like, we make a lot of bowls. And I think that's because I like making them so much. Uh, I have this one rib that I brought um, that I'll show you that's like just. Do you need it? Oh, I love, yeah. Is it this big one? It's the big one. Isn't that nice? Ooh, ah, stainless. Yeah. Uh, I, I feel like I used to make a lot of bowls with small ribs. Do you guys make bowls with small ribs? How's that going? Because <laughs> um, I feel like making them with larger ribs has been really, really helpful. Um, and it kind of changed the way that I approach making them. Now, it's going to look a little bit biased here because I'm making kind of a bigger bowl. but. It works for smaller bowls too, as long as they're the right diameter. Um, my philosophy on bowls, and I'm sure I'm not alone in this, is I don't want to find a bottom. I want to be able to like look into the bowl and have no idea where the floor is, where the wall is. You know, all of that stuff is just one big unified curve. So when you put the right glaze in there, and it gets like little speckles and stuff, it's like the whole universe is inside the bowl. Um, it takes longer to wash the dishes that way because you're just staring into all of them. But you know, it makes it worth it. And I feel like that's easier to get in wrap, you know, enveloped in when you've got that really nice curve that happens. How many pounds did you start? I have no idea. I'm gonna say f three and a half to four. So but you know. Oh, and that what well, that's right, because the poor people on television, hi, are going to say three or four what? Weeks? <laughs> months? What is he talking about? So the, yeah, the question was how many pounds, and we're thinking three and a half, four pounds, something like that. <laughs> Another big tip that I learned not long ago is that if you get the rib, do you guys like, do you start with the rib on the inside, you know, and then you kind of work your way out? How's that going for you? Not so good. So what I figured out, or <laughs> I figured out because someone told me and then I figured out they were right, <laughs> is, you start, right? So I start from the outside rim and then head towards the bottom. So you start out here. And you go towards the interior. And let me tell you, the experience is totally different. 
out, you know, when you're on the inside and you go to the outside, you're like, oh, don't fall over, don't fall over, right? With this, you get more resistance as you go down, right? Because you've left more clay down towards the foot. So that resistance is like, all right, and you can really kind of dig into it. And so that form really starts to take shape. It's great, it's the best. <laughs> and it's, I feel like it's such an enjoyable experience that that's why we make tons of them. I feel so. like bowls are our groove. We definitely like making bowls. And you don't have to put handles on them, which makes them even better. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you could, but it's weirder if you do. So I have a, a pottery shop that I've started with a group of six other potters in Kansas City. We're conveniently located right next to um, a really great coffee shop. So, and we have a florist on the other side of us. So it's like, could we have picked a better location? It's um, a very up and coming neighborhood and there's a lot of artists and um, stuff like that. It's definitely, there's exciting stuff happening. And I get the opportunity, we're only open three days a week so it doesn't cut into my studio time so much. And I only have to watch the shop one day a week. Um, but. I get to see, you know, what the customers are interested in and have like a direct line to people, which I've never really had too much before. When I was a resident at Aeromont, it was the whole summer, it was kind of like that, but those people were already a very informed audience. They were taking workshops there. They were whatever craft media they were interested in. They already understood like why something would be priced the certain way or the value of the handmade. And um, so that was a different audience, but. So now we get people, you know, that understand good coffee. So that's good that they understand that and they love the neighborhood. Um, so they're already educated to a certain level about what it is that we do. My point in saying all of this is that people have been really interested in bowls lately. So that really works for us. Doesn't yeah, it, it really does. <laughs> because ramen is so hot right now. Yeah. And like, what are you going to eat that out of? A plate? Not very well. That's right. So. Plates, bowls are the new plate. Yeah. I am just attaching the two pieces and I'm just holding it like a baby bird, not trying to squash the volume at all, just being really gentle and tender with it. And I'm just pinching those outside edges to maintain that volume. That's so nice. The baby bird? The baby one's like a little baby bird. Yeah. We just opened right before the holidays. So yeah, um, and we're, we're open three days a week. There are three of us who have studios in there. So there's seven of us members, and then we all have work inside this, the shop. The three of us watch the shop, basically. Um, the question is how long had our organization been planning on uh, having a shop? So our organization formed in 2014, and we were never intending on having a brick and mortar. Our goal was to um, create an exhibition where we could showcase pottery to Kansas City um, and invite people to come and showcase pots with us and have an artist-driven organization and exhibition, basically. Uh, there are seven of us in the group. We all bring different skills and different goals to uh, the group. Most of us are making a living off of being potters. Um, one person is a teacher at the Art Institute. Um, and then a couple other people have various income streams, not just one thing. Um, so when you get that, you get people with different goals and different skill sets that they bring to the table. And one of our members is um, tenacious when it comes to hunting out properties. Oh my and gosh, he, yes. <laughs> he found this building for rent that didn't have a for rent sign on it or anything. And he knew the right people and knew how to ask and approach them. So we were able to negotiate a contract and a rent that was really reasonable for us. So it was never something that was a goal that we had. It just kind of fell into place. Uh, and it's really, it's, it's really fun. We have a three year lease. I don't know if it will continue after the three years. Um, it's, it's just, I'm not sure what will happen, but for right now, it's great. We had to do a lot of work to the space. It was really raw and rough. Um, and so of course, before we could get in there, we had to do some heavy renovations, but that was part of the reason why the rent was so cheap too. I'm just going to set the baby bird aside to dry a little bit. And while she's doing that, I'm going to talk about my baby bowl bird. <laughs> so um, if you kind of look at the profile of this curve, 
It's okay on the outside, but it's not where I'd want it to be. But the inside is sweet, right? So when I'm making a bowl in a particular uh, process like that, you, I'm trying to make that inside curve exactly what I want and then just trim away whatever I don't want on the outside. So it's not bad. We're just going to get it better at that trimming process. And we might be able to do that tonight, fingers crossed. So, um, but that's the general idea. It's like kind of work on that one thing that you know you can like take care of on the back end versus trying to get the walls perfectly symmetrical, you know, and then like trim the least amount. I mean, there's a certain amount of trimming that I'll do and a certain amount that I won't do. But that's, that, I mean, I draw the line at bowls. It's like get the inside sweet and then take, take care of it on the outside. Um, so what we do with collaborative stuff is we deal a lot with um, surface over texture. And so that's my job, you know. So I get to do some form and then I can do some texture and then I'm like not allowed to do anything else, right? Actually, no, don't worry, I still do lots of stuff. But um, what, uh, what I get to investigate then is like how can I make a texture that's going to be kind of within the wheelhouse of our inspiration that's not going to totally throw her under the bus when it comes to getting a surface on there. So the consideration of like how my collaborator is going to respond to like a really great thing that I want to do, but like you couldn't possibly put any type of really nice surface on. So I'm trying to kind of go back and forth and consider what she's going to do with it next based on like all the like love and desires that I have, you know, as far as working on that form. So what I'm going to do here is just kind of bisect this form um, so that I've got um, kind of this really rough type of texture on one side with this uh, zester, handy dandy zester. And then on the other side, it's going to be a sure form texture. We don't usually do like a 50-50 type of thing, but you know, I don't know. The milkshakes, I'm inspired. So go for it. Floats, right? The floats. Um, it's usually pretty basic. I've trimmed the form. It doesn't really have a foot, except for maybe an indentation on the bottom so it doesn't rock, you know, once you put it on the table. Uh, it's going to get a handle at some point. But before I do that, I want to get this texture on there, and then the handle comes next. So you can see I've got a... How close does this... See? There's a line there. It's a GoPro. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. It's not, it's not really bending much. Uh, I threw it at 5 o'clock. We put a torch on it. Presto, change-o. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's definitely the leather hard stage. This is always kind of tricky, right? You know, it's like you're trying to get a surface on there that looks really good, like a texture, but then you know you have to add a handle so it can't be too dry, but then it can't be too wet. Yeah. <laughs> so for us, actually choosing clay bodies like this that have a little bit of tooth, you know, a little bit of grog in them, um, helps with that. It gives us this window, a better window to work with. Could we do this in porcelain? <sighs> Maybe not with the handle. I mean, the handles would probably want to crack off. You know, I mean, okay, Tommy making this stuff, the handles would probably want to crack off, <laughs> right? Because it would just be too smooth. So having a groggy type of thing helps to, to kind of deal with that. This is one of those things where, like, when you have to do it in front of people, it's like, ah, I feel so, you know. <laughs> oh, I'm going to mess it up. And then you like get into a groove, and then. No. <laughs> yes, I will give you a close up. Um, let's see if we can get the shadow to work right. No, no. Oh, so there's a, wait, here. Oh, yeah. See? Oh, yeah, it's nice. Look at that. Wait, out of, oh, yeah, okay. Our, I, in my experience, the collaborative work has definitely informed my own work and precisely for what Tommy was just talking about with the texture. Um, if anyone has ever painted over a brick building <laughs> or tried to maybe even paint a mural on a wall that's really heavily textured, it's tricky getting that brushwork in there, getting those lines to be crisp and straight because that texture just completely, you know, works against you trying to get any kind of straight line happening. But I've kind of fell, fallen in love, and I'll do a little bit of um, demonstrating with it later after the break, with the sponge brushes on the, on the um, just a foam brush, like a really cheap foam brush. It holds so much um, of the terra sigillata slip mixture that we use that it, um, it just creates a really fun line that really reminds me of 
um, worn street signs on the pavement, like dividing uh, highway dividing lines or you know a big arrow in the middle of the turn lane that's kind of worn off over time. I'm really like getting excited about that kind of mark making. And then with my own work, um, I don't know if you guys can see this. Oh, uh, I've created a texture onto this in a direct response to um, what Tommy has done. So this is the texture on the porcelain. I don't know if you can see that, but there's um, a straight up and down kind of line that is made with a completely different tool. And that is uh, a wire wrapped trimming tool that has, um, I have three or four of them. Some of them are tightly wrapped and some of them are really mangy looking. Yeah. <laughs> So. This is so fun with the camera. Okay, so <laughs> so that was the texture that we had from the uh, right, and then this is what we have from the sure form. Camera one, camera two. You can't tell the difference. Can you on the thing? Okay. Um, the the really cool part about this is that I, this is this is not mind blowing stuff, right? For anybody else, I'd be like, yes, you should have been doing that six months ago. I can go at an angle too. You know, like instead of just going for them. So I've been experimenting with that. And it's so funny because Chandra's like, whoa, 45 degrees, all right, okay. You know? So, you know, these like revolutionary steps forward when it's like, you're just, yeah. You know. All right. Uh, handles. What? That. The bed. That pastor. That mug. Oh. Oh, thanks. Perfect. Handles. You guys make handles for stuff? Do you like that? Yeah. Do you pull handles? Do you pull handles because someone told you that's the only way you can make handles? Okay, all right. I'm like, these are like very uh, loaded questions. Right? Um, I feel like I had to like pull handles because that was the only way you're supposed to make handles. And uh, I think that's not true. Uh, so for most of the stuff that we're making now, the handles are um, pinched instead. And I feel like I can do it faster. I feel like I have less cleanup that way. It's a little bit more direct. It looks a little bit different. And what's that? Yeah, then they're not wet, you know? So then you can go faster, you know? So I can actually, I can get away with making a whole bunch of handles and then handing them right off to Chandra and not having to wait like a whole night for them to dry. <laughs> so that's a good thing. Um, because yeah, otherwise they get all like, Lucy and they're fighting gravity and then you have to like prop them up and then you have to clean them up and you know this is a little bit more immediate so to do that I just start by rolling it into a ball that's a good question I think on that one it is dipped the glaze Oh, I taped. Are you talking about those straight yeah. lines? Yeah. I taped those off oh, okay. with masking tape okay. and dipped the whole thing. Yeah. So when that handle gets around, you guys will notice that it's kind of like a tree frog where it gets a little bit wider to stick to the body of the mug and it's a little bit thinner and then it's tree frog again. So I basically make what I, I do weird visualizations. I don't know if you guys do visualization stuff when you're doing like totally non-related things. I'll think about the weirdest stuff. Anyway. Um, that's right. That is a pinched handle. Yeah, it's a pinched handle. Um, how it starts is basically that visualizing thing. If you can see this, this looks like, to me, a, like the end of a railroad spike. And then I just make two of those, right? So it's somewhere between the railroad spike and a, a spool of thread. And so what I'm doing is I'm just compressing down and I feel like I get the best compression with my thumb just right up against my palm. And it kind of makes it a little bit round. Um, then that gets flattened, kind of flattened in like a diamond shape. Is this working? Yeah, it's kind of working. All right, then I flip it. You kind of flatten that into a diamond shape. And then what I do is I just start pinching those things together. So uh, in, in a way it's like starting the way that I want to finish. I don't have to try to like make a round thing or a tubular thing and then figure out how to all of a sudden make it feel like a comfortable handle. I'm basically making a kind of a comfortable handle from the beginning, but it's the chunky version. 
and then I make it like a little bit leaner and tighter and leaner and tighter as it goes. Does that make sense? Right? Because I don't know how many times I would make handles and try to figure out a way for them to be right at the end, as opposed to just kind of making them right from the beginning. Yeah. Because I'd find that the ends were too fat, or they weren't fat enough, you know? Like you didn't have enough confidence in them. And this is just like fun, you know? Funner. Yeah, I end up with this spine. Kind of see that in the light? There you go. See that spine? And then I can just compress that spine down. I just do that, you know, as it kind of builds up. Well, the spine's just naturally happening from the pinch process, you know, and I'm just getting rid of it. The reason why I get rid of it is because if you're, if you're putting your fingers in here, if you're putting your fingers like that, uh, like that, you can kind of visualize this, that mug with a spine on the outside. Um, it's, kind of, it's just kind of a one finger mug. Maybe if you have small fingers, a two finger mug, which means the spine's gonna dig into whatever finger is not inside the handle. So with a, with a mug like that, where it's kind of like wide out from the handle, you've got a lot of cantilevering you gotta do. Like you've really gotta pull that bad boy back, you know, in order to get it into your mouth. So there can be a lot of pressure on that finger. The more pressure you're going to have like that, the less someone's actually going to enjoy using the piece. And if we're making things by hand for people to enjoy, then we might as well make it the best possible experience. So thinking about that comfort, because I've made bad handles, allows me to think, okay, you know, I need to make something better. So I get rid of the spine, right? That's why I'm getting rid of the spine. What are you doing? So you're just going to keep on pinching that? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about these craft foam templates that I've been using. Um, okay. So I have a variety of these uh, basically frames. They're templates that uh, I design on paper and then transfer them to craft foam. And I, I'll just pass around a piece of craft foam if you guys don't know what it is. But it's, um, yeah, thanks. Yep. It's a ethylene vinyl acetate foam. It's basically uh, a thinner version of shock absorption in your shoes. Um, that you can see, like, go ahead and that piece isn't precious to me, so go ahead and see, like, you can stretch it. It's stretchy. Um, it's really easy to cut. Uh, it's fairly inexpensive. And it comes in really great, bright colors. And so I have a, and because it's so inexpensive and easy to cut, it's really easy for me to make a bunch of different shapes like this. It's pretty low risk. It doesn't take a lot of time and special tools or anything to try out new forms. So that's one reason why I really, really like it. Um, basically, so I've cut some concentric shapes and they all kind of nest together. I don't know if you can see this. Um, they perfectly nest when they're flat. There is no space in between them at all. And I'm just rolling, I rolled them out, um, rolled a slab out and then lightly uh, pressed the craft foam template into that damp slab and then um, cut it around it so that it's around the shape. And then I'm placing it with the craft foam frame side down onto the upholstery foam. And I've got a couple of different sizes of wooden balls. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go around and I'm going to create a divided dish using the wooden balls pressed into the slab, kind of like that spoon, you know, pushing that into the foam. It will create little, um, little separated cups or bowls around um, six sides of this. So I'm going to start with the smaller one. I've got two here and I'm not quite sure which is the right size. So I'm going to go ahead and start with the smaller one. And if I need to have a little bit more size for each cup, I'm going to move to the bigger one. So I'm just lifting up with my fingers, just touching the craft foam on the outside. I'm just kind of working that ball into a little circle so you can kind of just see each indentation. And I'm going to work um, on opposite sides. This lifting up motion is really important. You want to lift up that edge so that while you're pushing the ball in, it'll help to that ledge to spring up. Otherwise, it has a tendency to just sag and be flat.
This one doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, if you wanted to put a, a, uh, a stem in between here, you could have like a double layered deviled egg tray or something. This is pretty small for deviled eggs, but you could use a bigger ball or you could even use like an egg shape and push it in there to make it um, better for deviled eggs. Well, I think it's a little small. But if I wiggle it into a circle, it'll make each one of those cups a little bit bigger. So let me just show you the back side of this. I'm going to work it a little bit more, but that's one of my favorite parts about this form is just the way that that underside looks. Six. Yeah, like a real hot six. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, recently, <laughs> I recently put a a cone in and it's, it was the first time that I'd put a cone in in a few years and um, five six and seven were all flat so so it's a really hot thing. <laughs> it's like a, a yeah or like a, a really yeah it's like a really cold <laughs> well then the, but then I back down I back down on my temperature so on that specific kiln you, you just can't always trust the numbers on kilns I feel like I mean I always thought 2232 was cone six right so I'm firing to a lower temperature than that, thinking, oh, it's probably like five, six, and then come to find out seven's flat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you use a porcelain that is four cone six? It is, yes. It's a Laguna's WC617. It's a Grolig. Do you know that clay? No, I okay. know Laguna. Yeah. Handle? Handle. Okay. So in deciding where the handle goes, I've gotten notes from my decorator over here. Um, instead of the glaze coming right from the interior, right to the rim, and then breaking right there, she prefers, and I think this is a fantastic idea, to roll the glaze slightly over. This feels a little bit better on the lip, which means she's like, Tommy, stop putting the handle right at the top, because if you put the handle at the top, we get this weird glaze thing, and I gotta wipe it off, and it's an extra step, you know, and then we can't go to dinner. So that stinks. So I'm like, all right, fine, I'll just lower the handle. Uh, so it usually starts a little bit lower from the top and then occasionally and not all of our mugs do this But what I like to do is get this line right here and have it meet right with this line So I'll kind of like work on accentuating that a little bit and it just kind of catches the eye You know it kind of keeps the eye moving around through the whole form um, Other considerations are whether or not this is going to be like a totally round You know kind of like U shape right or a C shape that's stuck on the side or if it's going to get a little more shape to it So occasionally it gets a little bit more oblong uh, inside of there. Uh, and kind of similar to the bowl, um, I'm focusing on that interior more and just making sure that that negative space looks really sweet because I can kind of adjust the outside a little bit, either by scraping it down with a rib or maybe cutting it with a knife. You know, these are things that like the customer will never see, but um, they'll see it in the finished product that it, everything kind of flows nicely together. So uh, when making the actual attachment, you know, I scored it with a fork. Uh, do you guys use forks to score things? If you're using needle tools still, like, you just have a lot of free time. Um, because this, has, this is four needle tools all in one. And, you know, if we can, this, is, this, ain't, your, this ain't your salad fork, tip, right? So I've actually taken the tines that are normally flat and I've bent them all. And then I sharpened them. So, like, n need I spend time in the state penitentiary, I am prepared. Um, but what this does is it basically just allows you to score up that surface a lot faster, you know, so it goes a lot quicker. Uh, another buddy of mine, he was smart. He just got like four needle tools and he just taped them together. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not rich like he is. So needle tools, man, they just grow on trees. Um, I occasionally I'll use slip. Most of the time I don't. Um, something that uh, a personal theory that I have that may or may not be true at all is that if this is kind of dry, and this is kind of dry. They'll stick together really well if you just scratch them up really nicely and just add a little bit of spit, water, like a little bit of anything. Where I've had the most cracking problems in was, is when this is a little bit dry and this is a little too wet. This is part of the reason why I feel like I can get away with it without having to pull them, right? Because when you pull them, you make them really wet, then they shrink more and that's when they want to crack. 
So the consistency is so similar that I feel like they stick really well. They don't crack ever, you know? <laughs> um, the other thing that's really nice about this not being sopping wet is that tree frog thing. Remember how I was saying that I leave thickness, you know? I can just compress that down, you know? And I feel like I've got something to grab to really stick on there. If this was all the same thickness and it wasn't left thicker at the, at the ends, there really wouldn't be anything to attach. There wouldn't be anything to grab and then stick on there. So I think of this as like if, you know, again, this is a stupid visualizing thing. If you've got a whole tree, right, and you can like, you know, wrap your hand around that tree and you can get down to the roots where it gets wider and you can just shove that thing even more into the ground. That's the stupidest thing in the world, but that's what I think of. Um, it's that idea of grounding it even more. So that firm attachment goes on there, and then what I'll do is I'll grab these little rubber-tipped tools. I've seen people make these out of like erasers, like those old-school cap erasers. You know what I'm talking about? You got a little chisel end here. Um, I'll just go around the edge of the surface like so. And that just gives definition to the line. Uh, it also, <clears throat> if it's going to crack on the edge, you've just compressed it so that it doesn't. So that's good. Anyway, and then it's pretty much done. And then, like, and then I'm done, right? So then it goes off to the decoration sector, which is what we'll hopefully get to later. Yep. The okay. pieces have to be drier, though. They need to be the dry side of leather hard in order to absorb that slip sedge mixture that I'm using. Otherwise, it's really hard to control the lines without, it's such a thin, we call it slidge because it's half slip and half sedge, so it's slidge. But um, if, if, we're, if, if we use it when it's too wet, it'll just run and drip down the sides of it. So there's a sweet spot with dryness that it needs to be in order to stay on the side of it. And speaking of cracking and compressing, I had the worst time when I transitioned from, I used to use uh, Cone 5B Mix by Laguna, and when I trans transitioned to porcelain, I had the worst time with things separating, warping, cracking like you do. And so um, I just, instead of rolling out a coil and then attaching the ends together, because that would always be where I wouldn't compress it enough and that, that would split open, I just cut a ring or a donut shape out of a thick slab and then attach that. So there is no place for the clay to open up or split. It's just one solid ring. How are we doing? Oh, I thank you. <laughs> you know what? You know what? Um, do you have a I think I think I, I think I do. Um, part of it is when I'm making that pinching motion, I'm moving up the piece very very slowly. So instead of like big compression moments or movements, it's just like little small ones, you know. So I'm kind of like zoning out when I do it. What I found is that it has a natural curve that develops if you keep doing it the same way. So if I'm going this way, right, then I will flip it this direction and do the same thing. I don't flip it that direction and now go against the grain. It's almost like creating a grain. But I think because those movements are so small, they just kind of compress themselves nicely. And then, um, and then I'm able to, again, press here on that spine. So that's kind of helping to hide it. And then uh, I'm just smoothing that over with my, uh, my thumbs. Um, if I feel like it's like, if it just needs more help, and like the, if you got closer, you can see the surface of this. It's kind of got that little bit of a torn surface, you know, when you have a flat clay thing that's the right dryness and you bend it, it gets tears on the outer part of the surface. Um, so that's what I've been kind of like working with my fingertips, and then you can work that with a rib. Like if you've got one of those red ribs, like these guys here, um, or a, a metal rib, like this guy, that can help too, and you just kind of make those small, mo you know, movements. Um, and, it, and it does help to get rid of it. So it's just kind of like about that touch, you know, and just kind of smoothing things out. Did you have a question? No. That glaze that we use really picks up the, the texture and the pinching too, which I think can be kind of nice. It breaks on the edges, but yet I don't want too much of that pinched look because it doesn't really go with the form. Yeah, because we're kind of like heading towards like a industrial-ish look. But like still handmade. Yeah. <laughs> oh. What's that? 
No, no, the glaze usually just ends up after the bisque process. Well, yeah, yeah, the, 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 the slidge, which is like that slip terracage combination, that goes on greenware. Uh, then we bisque fire that. And then any underglazes like the orange color and things like that, those we put on after the bisque. So after the bisque, we're doing an underglaze color choice, um, a, usually a clear glaze that's kind of glossy to accentuate some of the differences between the underglaze surface and maybe that terracage surface. And then we're using a soda wash mixture. And the soda wash, it's kind of like a solution, but it's not a good solution. It's an oversaturated solution where you have chunks and stuff in it. And then that goes onto the surface and it usually creates these like kind of eaten into pockets or areas in the clay. Um, and like a couple of these examples are like really good to see kind of like where some areas have, are a little bit drier, some are really kind of chewed into, you know, by that soda ash crystal thing that's happening. Um, so it's making the thing, you know, putting that uh, terracage on it, bisking it, and then kind of making another set of decisions as far as decoration. Because then it's like, okay, where are we going to put these specific pieces of color? And you've got, like, in the case of some of these over here, like the white, the gray, the pink, the yellow, some of those have already existed before the bisque stage. Um, so you've got this, like, layer that you know is going to get amplified by a clear glaze or soda ash in a different kind of way. And then you want to add this other color on top of it, and you're kind of jumbling all these things at the same time. And sometimes it works really well, and sometimes it really doesn't. So, but it's nice. Tommy, would you say that your work at all has been informed by our collab work, or? No, I don't make my work anymore, <laughs> because I'm too busy. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it has. And, and some of it, you know, has been, um, in the total uh, reciprocal way. You know, where Shonda was kind of talking about some textured surfaces, you know, and some of her forms kind of changing. For me, the like actual slip application or maybe getting over the fear of putting a glaze surface on that's intentional. You know, the, a lot of the, the school of functional ceramics that I came through after undergraduate school through a lot of those residencies was like, um, I'm going to use atmospheric firing as a crutch, so I'm going to soda fire things and wood fire things because, dear God, if I put the glaze on in the wrong place, it's going to look like crap. No one's going to want these things. They're going to be awful. Um, and working with Chandra, I've actually gotten a little bit braver you know, about approaching some of those surfaces, um, mostly because she's like, it's OK. You can try it. You, know? you, you might not mess up. And oh, but use this formula, too. And I'm like, OK, good, formula. All right, I can work with the formula. So yeah, I would say that my surfaces, you know, and kind of like how I consider some of that has been amplified um, from our collaborative stuff. Yeah. So that's been good. Yeah, I think it's been really fun and challenging. You know, there's, I love listening to people talk about collaboration depending on, you know, regardless of the art form, it doesn't need to be in clay. There was an interview on Fresh Air, I can't remember the, the um, musician, but Terry Gross was talking to him about collaboration and he just said the most simple thing collaboration takes you places you never would have gotten to on your own and I, I really related to that in some ways it's given me an excuse to revisit old ideas that I'd abandoned while I've been working in this body of work I have this love affair with red clay and the surfaces and the depth and uh, the complexity that a red clay service can provide but what I'm doing right now in porcelain it's not really it's, it's a completely different vocabulary. So this gives me an awesome opportunity yeah. to really explore that. And I have, don't really care much about clays. Like red clay, white clay, low fire, high fire, like none of that stuff really mattered too much to me. Um, but I haven't been throwing a lot of pots. I've been making more sculpture in the last few years. So this gives me the excuse to go back and steal some of my own ideas, mm -hmm. which were stolen from people before me, <laughs> as far as kind of creating a different, you know, or bringing that form language into the work that we're doing together. Yep. So there's stuff that shows up, like there's a few vases that we've got recently that those forms are stolen from my like 2004 life. You know, I mean, it's stuff that I haven't made in over 10 years. And so I get to go back and reappropriate my own work and then adapt it to what we're doing together. And that part's been really cool. It's like having permission to go back and make those types of pots, and, right? And Tommy can throw big stuff, right? And I, I can make things that are not this big. And so when Tommy gives me something this big to deal with, I have to figure out how I'm going to change up the scale of my decoration. 
I have to figure out how to glaze the inside of something this big. I mean, and this with a lot of glaze inside of it is really heavy. <laughs> so like all these challenges that I wouldn't have probably ever encountered in my own studio practice, I'm now becoming a better craftsperson and I think a better artist because of that dialogue that we have. Yeah, we should hug. <laughs> The, so the question was, how do you structure your own uh, individual time and balance that with the collaborative studio time, and how do you perceive those challenges and overcome those? And we definitely set aside um, chunks of time to work because timing is so important with when he makes um, a grouping of work, he might make 20 to 30 pieces at a time, and then they need to be at a certain dryness before I can come um, and do my part with them. So we have tubs with the plaster in the bottom which keep them moist and allow us to really, when we're ready, then we can come back and use them. But we try to attack it pretty quickly. So if Tommy throws the beginning of the week, I try to carve out time at the end of the week and we're communicating about when that's gonna happen, so. Yeah, I've learned not to be like, hey, I made 20 mugs. <laughs> Go get them. You know, she's like, what? No. Like, <laughs> mm -mm. But uh, it's yeah. really hard though because sometimes I get lost in this and I don't want to go back to my own work. And I really just want to do the next round of these and I get lost into that cycle. And that's hard because then you have deadlines and balance, you know, to balance your own studio practice too. And then I have to f fall in love with my own studio practice again. So sometimes that's, you know, but again, it really does allow me to play around with texture and some new techniques that I hadn't really thought about doing before we did the collaborative stuff. So I feel, I feel like it's, it's good. Yeah. No, mm -mm. no, maybe, you know, we might set aside a month to collaborate together um, or two weeks a month. Yeah, usually it's the type of thing where we're working backwards. So if we know we have an event like this, we know that we have a certain amount of inventory and we're trying to fill in or maybe try some new things with that, you know, to add to that inventory that we've already got. Um, then it's like, okay, it's got to come out of the kiln on this day so that we can physically get in the car and drive to Minnesota, <laughs> right? And so that means it's got to go in the kiln on this day and then it's got to get glazed on it. So you just kind of like do it backwards. And so I, I, I start, I sound like Rain Man, you know, <laughs> where I'm like, two weeks till Wapner, you know, like, you got to decorate this stuff. Shotter's like, we're going to do it tonight, be calm, you know. Um, so yeah, well, there's a lot of conversation about like, this deadline's coming up, we have to kind of approach it like this. And then there's like a make or break time where it's like, okay, we're not going to do that anymore. You know, like that's, that body of work's not going to happen. Or those experimental forms, we have to wait, you know, another couple of months till we can kind of circle back to it. Um, so there's a lot of conversation about expectations, deadlines, what's actually going to happen, what can't actually happen. Um, you know, the like balancing out the like, I really think we should do this. And I'm like, I have, there's no way we're going to be able to do that. That's not going to happen. She's like, no, 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 not this time, next time, you know. So um, it's like therapy. It's nice. It's like <laughs> collaboration. It's like couple therapy. You know? um, <laughs> So I just cut the, uh, the interior space out of the spoon. I had to make a decision about which end I wanted the, to be the handle. And I've flip-flopped this form. I've made a big oversized handle with a tiny little spoon bowl. And this is a smaller handle with a generous spoon bowl here. So um, I basically just free formed the circle and cut that out. So this form is completely hollow. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to shove a little wedge of clay inside here so that that channel doesn't go all the way through and it blocks off that space. And it actually also maintains the volume of the handle once that air is um, choked off and then you don't have to worry about squishing it too much. Then the next thing that I'm going to do after I do that is I'm going to take the wooden ball and push in just to get a little bit more volume in this spoon bowl place. And Tommy's now using the zester. I'm just getting crazy. What? Got diagonals going all crisscross and everything. You know, it's, it's something like, so we've both been out of graduate school for seven years now. And I think, and so, like in my situation, I did residencies for a couple of years and then settled into my own studio. 
And I think setting, it's really important to set up little events or shows where people care about what you're doing because it's really easy to get lost after school because in school people care and you have these deadlines and you have to make this work and people actually care if you're making the work or not. And um, if you don't have those continue to, um, to happen, you kind of, nobody really cares if you fall off and stop making art. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I feel like part of our collaborative work too is that we really can talk to someone who cares about the forms and I think that we grow in that way also. Mm -hmm. Just like Tommy was talking about how I asked him to drop that handle down so that I could have a space to, to glaze the rim and have it overflow the side of the rim a little bit and then he did it. <laughs> <laughs> he listened. It was amazing. That actually, you know, when you mentioned the the idea of like no one, maybe nobody paying attention. Yeah. We've been talking about we were making we were talking about making collaborative work two or three years before we actually did. You know that type of thing of like wouldn't it be cool if we made collaborative work? You know, and uh, we had a friend of ours who was like we're making we're doing a show for Encika in Providence. This was a couple of years ago, just based on that idea. Do you guys want in? And we're like let's do it. You know, it's like we've been talking about this for years. So it was the total excuse to actually sit down and make the work. And the first batch of work sucked. It was awful. Gosh, <laughs> it was so bad. Um, but it was perfect, you know, because it's the type of thing where it's like, well, let's not do that again. You know, and you, we immediately start making uh, a response to that that was much mm -hmm. better uh, and still not great. And then it's kind of con. Like there's, there's a certain level of return. Like we're getting higher returns, like a better yield as far as our own interest in the work. And then uh, we're getting good returns from other people, you know, who said they're really enjoying the work too. And it just seems like every generation of work, mm -hmm. um, we get more and more excited about. But we wouldn't have done it, had, I mean, we wouldn't have really done it, you know, had someone not said, look, I'm putting you in this show, uh, get stuff done by January. Um, so it was nice to actually have, again, that kind of deadline of someone watching, you know, kind of paying attention and putting a little bit of pressure on. And I think, you know, our first inclination when we started collaborating was to talk about what we wanted the work to look like. Mm. And we identified a couple of things, like we wanted to respond to our city and the place where we lived in mm -hmm. Kansas City. Mm -hmm. But really, I think what we did was we defaulted to our old kind of standby methods. And that's what we had to do to get the work made so that we could respond to that. And yeah. that's okay, because it's yeah. part of the process. Yeah. And then once we were able to respond to that, that's what Tommy was talking about with that dialogue that continues and you really get invested in the evolution of your work. The, so the reason that I'm going to push the ball in there is just because this is just a little bit uh, flat. There's not a nice volume happening. Look at us. Yeah, the question about like work-life balance when you've got two bodies of work and another job. It starts to get really tricky. It's better. I gotta work this little area a little bit. Go ahead. Well, I was thinking about the fact that like I've got an arts administrative job like a full-time job. And then I've got my body of work, and then we've got the collaborative body of work. And then Chandra's got her full-time full you know, studio making, and then our collaborative body of work, and then the administrative stuff that she does for her, for the Kansas City Urban Potters. And um, I don't, you know, we don't have kids, so hey, I guess we get to do this, you know, so. Um, but it, yeah, the, finding the time's kind of tricky, you know? Okay, I'm just gonna set this over to dry. We don't. I'm going to use a heat gun. Yeah, we got a heat gun. How close are we to the intermission time? I'm ready to blast with some heat. Where are you? Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. Any, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any, any time. Yeah. Sure. That sounds good. Sure. Fair. And that'll allow us to, like, you know, set a few things up so that we can do some deco. And then I'll talk about my wacky work that I make in the second half. It's not. Um, 
my studio and the red clay part of the collaboration, all of that happens um, at the at the Belgian Crane Art Studios where I'm the studio manager. Chandra used to have a studio in the basement of our house, um, but then when the Kansas City, Kansas City Urban Potters space became available and she could move into a space with two other people, she preferred to do that. So now the dog just rules the house all by himself, you know. And we should probably put a studio in for him because I think he's really bored now without having somebody, you know, around all the time. Um, but, you know, the, the space that I manage, you know, we can access at any time. And there, there is a bit of like the segregation of like all this nice white clay that she's working on at her studio, not, you know, getting messed with with the introduction of red clay stuff. Um, and it's actually kind of, it works out kind of nicely because when Chandra's wanting to explore, you know, some red clay ideas of her own that are not inside the collaboration, she still comes and uses my studio space. She just rents studio space for the month. You know, can come in and do all the red clay stuff that she wants there instead. So we're kind of lucky that way, you know, where we've got options inside and outside of the house. I feel like I do like chest compressions when I'm doing this, you know, like I feel like if I did this all the time I'd be like, like ripped, you know, I'd have this like, but my shoulders would be like stuck in, you know, like I'd have to like do rows to, to really like, you know, oh, yeah, look out Hugh Jackman, yeah baby. Oh gosh. I do. I do. Uh, but it's a challenge to think of that. You know, because the, you, you get into repetitive motion things like this and you just do it the same way. And you kind of love that. It's kind of a meditation about doing the same thing the same way. But then your customer base is like, dude, like, not all of us have sausage fingers. Some of us are dainty, you know. Make it smaller. So yeah, in fact, this one I'm kind of like, make it smaller, you know. Um, and on that, like the initial coil that I rolled, you know, it's just a matter of making that just a little bit thinner. I found when I was making that too thin, that initial coil, it set it up to be like a really long, very thin, completely stupid handle. You know, it's like out here, you know. So you need like two hands to like, drink out of it. Um, it but it's about, it, there's like a consciousness, you know, of trying to think of making something a little bit different, you know, every time. We made a batch of handles like this that were just tubular, you know, so instead of, like, keep rad, dude. She's from the 80s. Yeah, like Ninja Turtles, tubular. Um, and they felt weird. You know, because they kind of would, they would hurt that. There was like a pistol grip, like a single finger. And it, the way that it rested on the hand was okay. But again, once it was full of coffee, it's like, I don't like holding it, mommy. You know, like it hurts. So that's when I kind of started flattening some of these things out. But like, that's kind of wide. Right. <laughs> the knife. So, so I'm just going to trim it off. All right, and while Tommy's trimming that, I'm just going to talk to you about how I got to this form here. Uh, Drape the slab over this round hump mold, and then I created the hollow feet in the same way that I made the spoon, and then cut them off. Um, didn't make two and attach them together, but just attach them to the back side of the the plate. That's a different one than the one you pushed the ball into. Yes, oh, okay. this is one I made right when we got here tonight. So it has the hollow feet on the bottom. And then the inside is? Concave. So, you know, I just cut that off and now I'm just like pinching it. You know, it's kind of important to pinch that so it's got some good compression so it's less likely to crack. But, I th you know, I think it'll work, it's thinner. daintier. Yeah, the idea of a mug that's that big and then being dainty, it's like, I know. I was thinking, actually, we, we mentioned this idea before when we were making this batch. I'd already made a whole bunch of these big guys. And it's like, we should make some Dimitas ones. Like, that'd be awesome. Like, little guys, little pinch handles, like, you know. Yeah, Christmas. Christmas. Easy to ship. Roll them out. It's so funny because Tommy only likes mugs that are this big. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Let's make them a toss. I mean, in our, in our house, 
a whole shelf is devoted. Those are Tommy's mugs. They're all this big. They're they can stunning. only fit in this one part of the count, <laughs> the count, you know, the cabinet because it's tall enough. And he drinks that much coffee. Yeah. Very excitable. <laughs> The one thing about the collaboration is, you know, if you're working in the same place at the same time, you can start to kind of drive each other a little bit crazy. Like, I'll make these pistol grip handles, and then I'll go up to Sean and be like, pew, pew, you know, she's like, stop it. <laughs> is that a smooth metal rib or a rib? This, this is the serrated paisley scraper by Cheryl Mud Tools. It's in the shape of a paisley. So it's called Paisley Scraper. I really love these because it has this edge and this edge and they're super flexible. And I'm just cleaning this edge. Yeah. And I will say that there is an appropriate stage of dryness where this work goes much easier if things are just a little bit drier, but I'm, I'm forcing it for the demo a bit. Exactly, yeah. When you guys attach handles, do you normally have like a, a thing that's thicker here and like thinner? You know, I, I don't know why, but my default is to put the thicker thing at the bottom. Do you guys put the thicker thing at the top? Why do we do that? It's just personal preference? Oh, is it upside down? Oh, because... Oh, yeah, uh-huh, and go up to the top, as opposed to going here. Kind of Some of there. those handles that are attached from the bottom to the top are really comfortable. Yeah. You know, the ergonomics on a handle is so funny. Like, the commercial mug that looks like the ear is so wrong. So wrong. And yet we've been supporting the commercial industry for years. Why is it wrong? Because the, er the ergonomics are completely opposite in how you hold your hand. You don't really hold your hand like this, you know, like, but, you know, you're... That you naturally do that, but the handles are like that. You know, that's why we have carpal tunnel. It's not this. It's not this. It's this. That's why. Hmm. The lobby is so strong, you know, with the blood mug makers. It just, what are you going to do? Powerless to stop them. <laughs> this, this is like so typical of like ceramic student parent. I had made a, a mug that was attached at the bottom, but it was no longer attached at the top. It had separated in the firing. And my dad's like, oh, son, you could sell that. It's quirky. You know, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, dad, I'm pretty sure it's like a social, if not like, you know, OSHA liability. You know, I don't think I can do that. And uh, he's like, oh no, I'm sure it's fine. So it was small, so my mom loved it and she wanted to use it for cappuccino. And so she was like drinking a cappuccino at night and sure enough, the handle broke, you know? And these are great. Hot coffee falls in her lap. She jumps off the couch, ah, you know? Woo! And I get to turn to my dad and be like, that's why. That's why we don't sell the quirky handles, Dad. This would be so a I good segue okay. for the camera. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Should we apologize to everyone out there in TV land, you know, who's not going to be getting one? We'll see them here next time. You ready for a break? Yeah, I like a break. Okay. Should we break? Yeah. Let's break. Let's break.